couple of defining characteristics of autistic people and autistic behavior are apparently contradictory. One of them is that we tend to be come across as very cold, very unemotional, very unfeeling. Autistic people are often described as lacking empathy. Another one, though, is the propensity toward what are called autistic meltdowns, which are essentially overwhelming expressions of emotion. And even, even the emotion can be positive, it tends to just be all-consuming. This is apparently a form of something called alexithemia, which is a condition that's not particularly well understood, but it has to do with a difficulty with feeling and expressing emotions. So what I'm going to do here is going to be not the most scientific explanation, but I think it'll be a functional one. The way an autistic brain is different from a neurotypical brain is that a neurotypical brain has many substructures within the frontal lobes, the part of you that makes you, you. And those structures are sort of designated toward things like regulating emotion, things like reading subtext and conversation, managing body language, everything you do that is sort of semi-conscious, not quite uh, an automatic re response, but things you do through the day without putting much thought into it. An autistic brain is has less of those kinds of substructures. It's more symmetrical. So, for example, if I'm feeling sadness or, or joy or frustration, it's less a feeling and it's more almost like a state of being. And this can come across as I'm either extremely emotional or I'm not emotional at all, one of the two. Where this gets to be a real problem is when you're experiencing an emotional response that you weren't expecting or that you hadn't anticipated. So for example, uh, when my father passed away, it was after a significant period of illness. So I kind of knew it was coming. Don't get me wrong, I was sad that my father died, but I just kind of accepted it as this is part of life. I had a friend who died in a car crash who I was nowhere near as close to, but it was, there was just this devastating shock of like, oh my God, you know, he died. He was just, I just, you know, I, he was just here. He was so, you know, it was just, um, even though it had no real, you know, bearing on my life, certainly not in the way that, that losing a member of my immediate family does. I found myself needing to discuss this with my, uh, my neuropsychologist because it can really impede the function of your day-to-day -day life and it can impede your ability to relate to and others, understand other people. Last year I was dating a lady for a while and after about six months I got the sense of she doesn't seem to be that into it, she's getting a little distant and sure enough the uh, relationship ended. And I was, you know, I was kind of sad that my girlfriend had broken up with me, of course. Nobody likes getting dumped. Nobody likes these things not working out. But I pretty much just moved on. It was fine. You know, it was, it was fine. And then a little more than a week before Valentine's Day this year, she kind of suddenly reached out. She, we were texting back and forth. We talked on the phone. I intentionally brought up the topic of dating just to give her there was anything she needed to tell me, even if it was just not, not into it right now, not looking, she could do that. After a couple of days of all of this, I said, hey, Valentine's Day is coming up. You want to go out? Oh, no, I'm seeing somebody. And everybody I've told the story to has kind of said, like, yeah, it's, that was kind of a shit thing for her to do, to reach out right before Valentine's Day, not tell you what's going on, you know, and, and wait for it to come up like that. People didn't understand why I was so upset about it, because I was very upset. Um, and the reason why I was upset was because it, it caught me out of the blue. Like, I'd, I'd kind of, in my head, I had figured, like, okay, 
this is this is being set up to something apparently maybe and then I guess if it had just been a no I probably would have been okay but when it was like okay well you were seeing somebody what's why didn't you point is what's my point here the point is that because that caught me by surprise and because I had not successfully anticipated my own emotional response to it, it was, it was really, it was really hard to cope with. So it's important to understand when dealing with people on the autism spectrum or people dealing with these kinds of emotional issues, it's not necessarily a true dysfunction. Because none of this stops me from living my life. Please don't misunderstand me. And in some ways, it's actually one of the reasons why I think most people who are on the autism spectrum say we wouldn't take a cure even if there was one. I'll give you another example of a moment I had like this. I uh, went to the walkway over the Hudson in Poughkeepsie, New York. It's a bridge that goes over the Hudson River and next to the walkway over the Hudson is an old abandoned building. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of this building but I know enough about construction and architecture that I was able to look at this building I was able to know what it was. I was able to identify some of the updates that were made and when and why and it was, it was like this building was just telling me a story. It was like it was like talking to somebody and they're telling you their life story and it's fascinating. It was just this, this beautiful moment. And I told my friend who I was with about this and she was just giving me this look like, what, like dude, it's a, just an abandoned building. Like, and I guess that, in, you know, that moment goes a long way to encapsulate the difference between an autistic and a non-autistic brain is that I, I see these moments of intense beauty, these moments of intense majesty, uh, a sunset, a particularly delicious food, a lover's touch, and it's just, it's so devastatingly beautiful. And if there was something that was going to make me neurotypical, I mean, giving all of that up, so... It's not something I want to cure for. It is something, as with any other emotional response, you need to learn to live with it, you need to learn to manage it, and, and keep your responses more or less socially appropriate, of course. But it's, it's more the kind of thing where I don't want people, I don't want to change, and I don't necessarily want my response to become, quote-unquote, the norm, I just want people to sort of accept that, you know, I'm, I'm living a different emotional reality than a lot of other people, and that's okay. And, yeah, it's kind of wonderful at times. It's, uh, it's much more of a highs and lows kinds of experience than I think most people have. But I'm really okay with it. The part of it that's a struggle is, as with my friend at the walkway, you know, people really misunderstand it. They take it as a sign of some kind of, uh, like, like mental illness or this person's unstable. And it's, it's not that. It's just, it's just I'm experiencing this unfiltered intensity at times. Or, if it's not something that, that triggers a reaction, I am not experiencing it. You know, if something doesn't provoke a reaction from me, then it's just... A thing that's happening and I move on as with when my father passed a lot of people commented some negatively I have to say about how sort of functional I was through that whole experience how it didn't seem to slow me down much in life um, but that wasn't a bad thing it meant that I was able to handle it it meant I was able to take care of everything that needed to be done in the wake of his passing so you know take this as this person is having a different life experience than me this person's viewing it a different way than me but that is okay you know it takes all kinds to make up the world as always i hope you found this interesting and helpful you know like subscribe share comment uh, always love that kind of stuff
and I'll see you on the next one.